1985, I was commissioned to write a play that would be performed in Portland's historic Piddock Mansion, located in the West Hills overlooking the city. The play had to be written in the form of a new play taking Los Angeles by storm at the time, a play called Tamara. This was a play with a branching narrative and simultaneous scenes occurring throughout a large performance space. This, of course, was hyperdrama, but at the time no one knew what to call it. Tamara, in fact, was called a living movie, but the producers had registered this phrase as a trademark. Well, we all thought it was sort of like registering sonnet as a trademark, but we couldn't use it. We didn't know what to call it. We ended up calling it simultaneous action theater. Too much of a mouthful. Well, to make a long story short, it took me a while to understand exactly what it was I was being hired to do, but when I finally did, we ended up with Chateau de Mort, my first hyperdrama. It was a great success, and I was hooked. I was hooked on stories with branching narratives. In the years and decade ahead, I wrote other hyperdramas, ending up with seven that got produced. Most were located in exotic locations, the White House Bed and Breakfast, the Edgefield Resort, one on the uh, on the Sternwheeler, on the Willamette River, and one in the commonplace location, a bar and a restaurant. Well, I learned very quickly that space is an essential character in live performance hyperdrama, that scripts must be tailored to their specific performance environments because actors are moving through this environment in real time with the audience in pursuit. We have to know how long it takes to an actor to move from one scene to another. Hyperdrama then is most efficiently written with a consideration for space and begins in fact with this consideration. A hypertech software program called Story Space is perfect for this mapping of the spatial contours of a story. So when I start a new hyperdrama project, I begin in Story Space and I develop, I develop my story as a kind of choreography of characters as they move through the performance space and I map out these narrative paths in the software. Now since scripts have a special format, I don't actually write in Story Space though you can do that, it's made for that. I use a specialized screenwriting program. There are many of these. I use one called Sophocles. Before going to Sophocles, however, first I translate this map of the story in story space into a more linear uh, storyboard, a kind of outline using a program appropriately enough called Storyboard. Then I go into Sophocles and I actually write the actual script. At this point, the writing moves forward differently depending on whether I'm writing hyperdrama for live performance or whether I'm writing hyperdrama to be filmed or, or videoed. Live performance hyperdrama differs from film or video hyperdrama in two really important ways. First, in live performance, the timelines of the actors and of the audience are identical. In film, or video, time is manipula manipulated by editing and translated into screen time, screen time, not real performance time. This means that in live performance, improvisation is inevitable because no production ever times out its sequences of actions as written on the page. So actors in live hyperdrama must be skilled at improvisation and at moving on and off script in an instant. This, in fact, is the source of much of the energy of the, forms vit uh, of, the t of the vitality of the form in live hyperdrama. So if I'm writing for live performance, I time each sequence as is completed. I actually have a stopwatch and I, and I do the scene myself, and I add this developing action to a flowchart that tracks the path of each character over time. This is a guesstimate of how the play is going to unfold in real space and time. In live performance hyperdrama, it's essential to cast actors who can handle this, this stress of moving on and off book, and doing so in rhythms that are going to change every night with every performance. Now, the director directing hyperdrama is faced with a great challenge. How do you direct a play that you can actually never see as a whole? 
Scenes are rehearsed as modules of the whole. This is what you direct. When the entire play is finally set loose, as it were, for a run-through, in rehearsal, actors should take notes of when and where the timing of the flowchart is most inaccurate, so that together the director and the actors can create appropriate actions and appropriate attitudes for improvisational dialogue that will keep the play moving realistically during these moments of improvisation. In film or video, there's never a run-through of the script. The script is assembled on the computer in editing. It's not performed. Now when I do this, I use a, a wide variety of software to make this editing process and the assembly of hyperdrama on video easier. Um, and these are just personal choices. There are lots of options for all of these activities. My primary editing software is Adobe Premiere Elements. I'm using version 3. For recording uh, narrations such as this, I use a, pro a free program, freeware called Audacity. For composing and recording soundtrack music, I use Finale and also sometimes Band in a Box. For manipulating still images that will be used, I use Photoshop. And if I get stuck with some technical problems along, along the way, I use a, an online forum that is quite excellent for videographers called moviepix.com. That's spelled M-U-V-I-P-I-X.com. I used to fret about the invisibility of and lack of appreciation for hyperdrama until a student of mine explained that actually the new dramaturgy of hyperdrama is at the very foundation of narrative in computer games. It's in this arena of computer games that hyperdrama, the new dramaturgy, is doing very well indeed. But I still ask myself, will live performance hyperdrama ever find a significant audience? Well, I think not, at least not until an artistic director with great vision creates a flexible new kind of theater space in which hyperdrama can be performed. Hyperdrama needs an address. Now one such design for such a theater might look something like this. In the middle of a very large room is a circular configuration of individual screens all pointing outward. Now onto these screens will be projected the images that define the space in a particular scene, a room, a field, a forest. Actors perform in front of these screens and move to another location or screen as the action dictates. The audience also is mobile, as it must be in hyperdrama, but now along the circumference of an even larger circle, close to but separated from the actors. So what we have are three concentric circles moving outward. First, screens that define the location. A circular performance space in front of these screens along which the actors will move. And a larger circular space in which the audience will move, or not, as they wish. Until hyperdrama gets a permanent home in such a theater space, or one of another workable design, I fear it will not be taken seriously. Hyperdrama really needs an address. It needs to become an extension of traditional theater. Not a, a traveling road show that now and again works as a kind of exotic event. Hyperdrama needs a permanent home. It needs a theater building. It needs a building with a new kind of interior design to accommodate its needs. Someone needs to build this theater and attract the audience that this exciting new dramaturgy deserves.